Well, first of all, I want to uh, thank Jeff for the, um, both the invitation and the, uh, and the introduction. Um, and uh, as he said, um, uh, Jeff was, um, we, we got to know each other first in the Global Mail newsroom. Um, and then uh, he was my bureau chief when I moved from Quebec City to Ottawa and uh, I was his bureau chief. And it's, that is actually an interesting cultural phenomenon for those of you who are um, uh, studying public administration. That's one of the particularities of, uh, of journalism that is unimaginable in government. It, people don't work for each, that don't switch roles like that in a more hierarchical work environment, which is one of the things that uh, I've had to adjust to, and I'll talk a little bit about that, that later on, of the transition from having uh, spent basically my career in journalism and then moving to um, be Commissioner of Official Languages. Jeff asked me to talk about how uh, journalists uh, hold governments to account and how um, agents of parliament hold governments to account. And um, first of all, I should tell you that both as a reporter and as an agent of parliament, I am not part of that group, which all polls show includes a majority of Canadians, that does not have any respect for politicians. Um, I've always had a lot of respect for, for politicians. Uh, they have, it is in many ways thankless work. Um, and uh, I have always uh, treated people, whatever their political affiliation, whatever their uh, political view, um, with respect. And, um, and I'm thinking about coming to speak to you, it is, occurred to me that, that actually it's not a very good idea to go into a field of journalism if you don't have any respect for the people who are doing the work that you're covering. Uh, if you don't have any respect for athletes, probably not a good idea to be a sports reporter. Um, uh, if you are uh, uh, contemptuous of the, uh, the people who are uh, engaged in uh, nutrition, um, probably not a good idea to write about food. Um, so I think respect has always struck me as one of the, the key qualities required to be uh, an effective journalist, certainly the, uh, the way I tried to uh, uh, conduct myself during my career. Um, I think there are a number of ways in which reporters hold governments and uh, individual politicians to account. Um, the most obvious is uh, investigative reporting. Um, and in many ways, that's the, uh, the most spectacular, whether it's uh, Watergate or whether it's uh, uh, Bob Fife having uh, revealed the uh, $90,172 check that uh, Nigel Wright wrote to Mike Duffy, um, whether it's the work on the robocalls that was done uh, um, by Glenn McGregor and uh, Steve, Steve Mahar. Um, that is the kind of work that is um, inevitably done by a minority of uh, reporters in, in most uh, institutions of journalism, which isn't to say that in any area that you, that you are working that there you cannot uh, find that there are areas that require serious investigation, that there can be ways in which you can pursue lines of inquiry that uh, go beyond what, um, what people are, uh, are saying in interviews or at news conferences. Um, Jeff's done more of that kind of work than, than I have, but there have been a, uh, at least a couple of examples uh, in my career. I guess the most recent stories that 
Jeff and I both, both worked on was uh, a story that um, uh, I did during the Mayor Arar uh, controversy in which, um, which was described by the Royal Commission as a uh, inquiry into the Mahar incident as a leak. It was not in fact a leak. It was a, uh, uh, I had figured out somebody who had probably been briefed by security uh, agencies and talked to him and uh, he told me um, uh, the nature of the briefing which, which um, convinced me and enabled me to write that the Canadian security forces had basically bought the, uh, uh, the CIA version, uh, version of events. But this was the exception of the work that I did through, through most of my, my years in journalism. There's another form of journalism which um, I, can, I would say uh, holds governments to account. It's a much more modest, much more day-to-day, -day, but I think in some ways uh, just as important, if not more so. I call it ladybug magnet journalism. Those are the stories that people who live in neighborhoods clip out and pin to their fridge with ladybug magnets because a reporter has been able to tell them about something that is happening or is going to happen or may happen in their neighborhood that enables them to work with, to mobilize with their neighbors. So it can be stories about a planning decision at City Hall, it can be stories about a, uh, uh, a campaign that is uh, being organized to uh, uh, clean up the banks of the, of the, the Rideau River, it can be uh, community mobilizing reporting that uh, enables people to have a better understanding of the decisions that are being made that affect their daily lives. It's often not dramatic, it's often not spectacular, it rarely makes the front page, but it, it is the, the nitty gritty decision making in community activities, in community work, in municipalities that has in many ways a much more direct impact on people's everyday lives than uh, the uh, uh, trade negotiations that uh, may or may not be going on between Canada and the European community um, and the variety of other uh, stories that, that are given often much more, uh, much more prominence. The third category I would describe as public memory journalism. And again, this often can be treated uh, dismissively as stenography, writing down what politicians say, writing down what officials say, the uh, um, uh, documents that they publish. The, uh, but it is the way that one can compare what people are doing and saying now with what they did and said during election campaigns, during the initial months that they came to power, during the times that a, that a policy was first announced before the measures were taken to implement it. And in any public debate on a matter of controversy, it is really important to be able to track a timeline of what what is being said now as compared to what was said a year ago, what was said six months ago, because that is also a very important way of holding governments to account. The, I guess the most dramatic example of, of public memory journalism um, that I was engaged in as a reporter was um, an interview that three of us at the Globe and Mail had with Brian Mulroney, uh, a story that was published on June 12, 1990. It was near the end of a, an extremely intense week of uh, negotiations uh, over the Meech Lake Accord. 
The Meech-Lake Accord was the agreement that had been reached by all 10 premiers in 1987 that would have permitted Quebec to sign the, uh, uh, the Constitution. And the nature of the agreement was that there was a three-year deadline that um, would uh, expire at the end of June uh, in 1990. And um, two provinces were d deeply resistant to it, and so there was an extremely intense week of negotiations going on day and night, some of those sessions in public, some of them in private, between uh, Prime Minister Brian Mulroney and the, uh, and the 10 premiers. It was um, uh, intense, it was dramatic, it was, uh, and at the, um, very late on the Friday night, um, it, um, in fact, I think it was even the Saturday, it was the Saturday night, a, uh, an agreement was reached and it looked as if this was going to be successful. And on, Sunday, uh, the Prime Minister was phoning around to the people who had been allies in this process, and one of the people that he called was William Thorsell, who was the editor-in-chief of the Globe and Mail at the time. <coughs> and Thorsell suggested to the Prime Minister that he should give an interview to the Globe and Mail the next day um, to uh, tell the people of Canada how this success had been achieved. Keep in mind that Brian Mulroney was exhausted, seriously sleep deprived, um, and, uh, but he agreed. And so um, uh, Jeff Simpson, Susan Delacourt and I went over to 24 Sussex um, on Monday morning and uh, sat down in his den and had an interview with him. And the, the fact of being so exhausted um, stripped away his natural defenses. Um, we got a glimpse of the colloquial, gamey, direct uh, Brian Mulroney, all of those qualities that he had used with great effectiveness to hold his caucus together. Unfortunately, the, um, his um, ruthless realism, uh, which came out in the interview, did not appear, uh, did not read well in print. And he told us how he had picked the day for the beginning of these negotiations, that he had um, identified the deadline <clears throat> and had counted backwards. Now, you ought to keep in mind that one of the reasons that he was <clears throat> relaxed and comfortable talking to us was that, um, with the exception of Susan, um, he knew Jeff and me. I had known him um, since uh, I moved to Montreal in, in 1976, and a mutual friend had um, um, put us in touch. And, um, I had <clears throat> covered parts of his return to, uh, to politics <clears throat> and uh, after having originally been defeated in 1976. I'd had lunch with him when he was um, a business leader in Montreal. <clears throat> he was one of the people who I interviewed several times because many of his, his uh, college classmates had gone on to become cabinet minister, ministers in the Patsy Québécois government. Um, I had been later, uh, that I, when I was with the Globe and Mail, um, I'd been on the plane that had flown into Bay Como on election night, ele the, for the election in 1984. So uh, even though when uh, I had only been in Ottawa for a few years when we did this interview, I'd known him for quite a long time and he was comfortable with me. He'd known Jeff for quite a long time. And it... I think speaks to the importance of journalists who are covering politics actually getting to know the politicians that they are, they are writing about. 
the questioning was not aggressive. It was, it was respectful and we basically listened hard to try and recreate, to get a, his sense of what was going to happen next and get him to recreate how the events had happened. Um, and uh, when he told us about counting back from the day that the um, incident, that the, uh, the deadline for the Meech Lake Accord, he said, so I counted back and said, that's the day I'll roll all the dice. And um, the impact of that story and of the subsequent transcript that was published in Saturday's paper the following, uh, the first story ran on Tuesday, actually contributed to the sense uh, that there was something wrong with this deal and um, reinforced um, both uh, those in Manitoba and particularly Clyde Wells in Newfoundland who were looking for justifications to vote down the agreement that they'd agreed to under substantial pressure uh, in Ottawa. Um, and so, <clears throat> again, not investigative reporting, um, not, um, not the kind of story that ordinary people would uh, pin out and attach to their fridge, but a degree of serious listening to somebody whom uh, Jeff Simpson and I had, had got to know well over the years, and the result was a remarkably revealing uh, interview which had um, uh, substantial um, political, political impact. Um, let me tell you a little bit about um, how I got uh, from, from there to here. Um, as Jeff said, we were um, um, both uh, reporters in the newsroom. I was uh, in, at the Globe and Mail. Um, I was concentrating on, on municipal affairs, uh, municipal affairs and then, and then regional development. Um, I spent basically seven years writing about um, city politics and there were ways in which, in some ways it was the most, uh, as satisfying as any other part of my career in journalism because uh, I focused in particular on planning and development and there was a period where I knew somebody at every level of the bureaucracy at, uh, in planning at, at City Hall. Um, I wrote a book about uh, a neighborhood that was threatened with demolition um, and uh, was, was covering city politics in Toronto at a time when the Globe and Mail was extremely interested in, in city politics, much more interested than it, it is, although Rob Ford has re reignited uh, interest in municipal politics in Toronto. Um, and uh, in the summer of 1976, I was um, approached by Maclean's to move to Montreal. I'd always thought that at some point I would um, moved to, to Quebec, I felt I had a kind of rendezvous because at, when I was at university, I um, spent three summer jobs working in Quebec. Um, the first summer I worked as a, on an archeological dig um, uh, on Ilo Noua, which is about 50 kilometers south of Montreal on the Richelieu River. And uh, that was the experience that transformed what had been a, high school subject into a language I could actually speak. And in the fall, when I was doing my study on, on uh, write, writing up my report on the archaeology I had been engaged in, I realized quite deeply that I was much more interested in Quebec than I was in archaeology. And I spent the next two summers working as a, um, uh, an orderly in a mental hospital in the east end of Montreal. And so this was at a period when, in the 1960s, when the Quiet Revolution was um, meant that, uh, and the independence movement meant that Quebec was a hugely dynamic, interesting, changing society. And so I always had some sense that, that I, uh, I would want to go there as a, as a journalist. So when I got the 
job offer from, from McLean's, I took it, but felt in a, in a funny way that this would be a continu continuation of my, my work on, on urban politics. The 1976 Olympics had resulted in the, um, a huge financial crisis for, uh, for Montreal. In 1975, New York had almost gone bankrupt, and so I had thought, well, the next, the next really dramatic urban story is going to be how Montreal fends off bankruptcy. Um, so we moved, and, um, and then in the uh, end of September, early October, uh, Liberal Premier Robert Bourassa called an election. Um, I got on the election bus and I only really got it off it ten years later. It was um, three years in Montreal and seven years in Quebec City in which uh, I covered the election of the Parti Québécois, um, the uh, uh, debate over the Charte de langue française and Bill 101, the uh, um, the various measures introduced by, uh, by the, uh, the new PQ government, the, uh, um, uh, the 1980 referendum, the constitutional debate that, uh, that followed that resulted in the patriation of the Constitution in 1982, um, the, uh, uh, um, the return of the Liberals in, in 1985, and then in 1986 um, I moved to Ottawa. And, um, uh, have basically been here ever since, with the exception of four years in Washington, where I was the Washington bureau chief for the Globe and Mail. But in a way, from that uh, experience in Quebec as a student, my experience in Montreal uh, in the late 70s, my experience in Quebec City um, in the early 80s, and then moving to Ottawa, I continued to follow language issues. And in fact, the, um, I wrote a book on, on René Lévesque and the Parti Québécois in power. And there was one chapter that I wrote about the cultural tr tensions between francophones and anglophones. And it didn't really fit into the narrative of the book, so I basically popped the chapter into a file folder and stuck the file folder um, uh, into a drawer. And then at the time of the Meech Lake controversy, uh, I pulled the file folder out and, and wrote a 60-page um, book proposal, which um, at that point publishers had had it up to here with, with anything about Quebec or language, uh, the Constitution. And so I then stuck that in a file folder. And in uh, 2004, 2005, um, uh, Doug Gibson, who'd been my publisher, who was the publisher of, of Douglas Gibson books at McClellan Stewart, had published uh, Jeff Simpson's book, The uh, Friendly Dictatorship on the Powers of the Prime Minister. Um, uh, Andrew Cohen's book on, on foreign policy. And so I thought Simpson on prime ministerial policy, Cohen on foreign policy, Fraser on language policy. And so I made the pitch uh, to Doug Gibson and he bought it. Um, and so I spent, um, took a leave of absence uh, from, I was then at the Toronto Star, took a leave of absence and, and wrote the book. And in the fall of um, 2005, uh, I had basically sent them, you know, it was down to the final revisions of the, uh, uh, of the book and bumped into Marcel Bélanger, who was then the minister responsible for language policy, who said, you know, the uh, position of Commissioner of Official Languages is coming open next year, is that something you might be interested in? And I said, I, I would be. And then uh, two weeks later, the Liberals were defeated, the Conservatives were elected, and I thought, well, if, if the Liberals were interested in, in appointing me, the Conservatives certainly won't be, so I forgot about that. And uh, to make a long story short, at the end of June, um, after the Conservatives were, were elected, uh, they decided that they would post the job 
Instead, previously, for the previous five commissioners, it had been a process that was worked out entirely behind closed doors in which the hand of God would descend on the shoulder of the person who was to be uh, named commissioner and uh, an announcement would be made. So um, I applied and uh, I, uh, I got the job and I became Canada's sixth commissioner of official languages. And, um, uh, my Doug Gibson, my publisher, said that it was the first time that he'd ever published a 93,000 word job application. Now, uh, when I applied for the job, um, well, the process is that um, your name is proposed by the Prime Minister, you appear before uh, a committee of the House and the committee of the Senate, they report to Parliament that they have heard your presentation. Um, they don't actually have power to refuse you or not. Um, and uh, then both houses vote. And so when I appeared before the houses, I um, defined the, um, uh, the position as part cheerleader, part nag. Um, the position is that of uh, an ombudsman. It was established um, in 1969 after a recommendation of the Royal Commission on Bilingualism and Biculturalism, in which uh, they called for the creation of not only an Official Languages Act, but someone who would report to Parliament on whether government had lived up to its responsibilities under the Act and uh, that they describe this person as being the active conscience, actually protector of the language rights of, uh, of Canadians uh, who would um, receive complaints, investigate complaints, um, and uh, actually act as an informal advisor to, uh, to, to governments uh, monitor whether um, pieces of legislation were appropriately respectful of uh, language policy and language rights, um, and report to, to, to Parliament, not through a minister. The, um, uh, and so it has always been described as a job of um, protection and promotion. And interestingly enough, in the recommendation of the Royal Commission and in the Act, there is relatively little that talks about the promotion aspect. And just yesterday, um, I was reading an MA thesis on the, uh, the role of um, uh, the Commissioner of Official Languages in terms of the independence of the role. And she pointed out that Keith Spicer, who was the first Commissioner of Official Languages, used Article 25 of the first Act, which is now Article 56 of the current Act, to really open the door to using a, uh, the position of the Commissioner to be a promoter of language rights. And Article 56 of the Act reads, it is the duty of the Commissioner to take all actions and measures within the authority of the Commissioner with a view to ensuring recognition of the status of each of the official languages and compliance with the spirit and intent of this Act in the administration of the affairs of federal institutions, including any of their activities relating to the advancement of English and French in Canadian society. And in the preamble, which was not in the, there are um, uh, a whole lot of whereases that again make it very clear that this is much broader than simply whether somebody can be uh, served in English or French when they get their passport. And whereas the Government of Canada is committed to cooperating with provincial governments and their institutions to support the development of English and French linguistic minority communities, to provide services in both English and French, to respect the constitutional guarantees of minority language educational rights, and to enhance opportunities for all to learn both English and French, 
And whereas the Government of Canada is committed to enhancing the bilingual character of the national capital region and to encouraging the business community, labor organizations, and voluntary organizations in Canada to foster the recognition and use of English and French. So from Keith Spicer's using a crowbar to open the door to promotion back in 1970 when he started doing this work, one sees that that promotional aspect has gone very strongly into the preamble and into Article 56. So there is this strong protection and promotion role uh, in the area of language rights. Well, let me talk a little bit about the category of agents of parliament. Um, the, we are guardians of values. Each one of these positions was created because parliamentarians felt that at a particular moment in time, it was important to create a position for someone to protect a value that transcended the partisan debates of the day. So the audit position of Auditor General was, dis, was created in 1868 um, at a time when there was a certain amount of, of uh, um, corruption in government administration. The Chief Electoral Officer was established in 1920 to ensure that elections were uh, organized fairly, that everyone would, that everyone's right to vote would be protected. Job Official Languages Commissioner was established by legislation in 1969 as part of the federal government's response to the surge of Quebec nationalism in the 1960s and the growing sense that had been identified by the Royal Commission on Bilingualism and Biculturalism that French was, was discriminated against and was, did not have the role that it should play uh, in, in, uh, in Canadian life. The Privacy Commissioner and the Information Commissioner's positions were both established in 1983 as there was a growing awareness of the threats to privacy and the importance of uh, transparency. You heard last week about the degree to which that is under threat. My, uh, I've often thought that in fact, uh, Suzanne Legault is the, is the only agent of parliament who faces the challenge of governments fundamentally not accepting the idea of the act. Um, there is a kind of Every other asp, uh, agent of parliament has um, a, uh, a general commitment and acceptance uh, that r ranges from grudging to enthusiastic, but government after government finds that it really does not like the idea of access to information. Um, and then the Conflict of Interest Commissioner and the Public in uh, Sector Integrity Commissioners were both established by the present government in 2007 and the Commissioner of Lobbying position was established in 2008. Now, to understand those la the creation of those last positions, it's worth understanding that there were a number of controversies that arose in part following the impact of the budget cuts in 1995. One of the effects of the budget cuts in 1995 was to eliminate a whole slice of the public service that was engaged particularly in the, what was then called HRDC, Human Development and Human Resources. Um, it changes its initials every few years, but it continues to work in the same, in the same area in which the people whose job it was to monitor the grants that went out to community organizations and non-governmental organizations, a lot of those positions were just eliminated. So it was not entirely surprising that there was an auditing gap. And this became known as the uh, billion dollar boondoggle. This was totally unfair, totally inappropriate, at the end of the day, when the dust all settled, there was a, what was 
thought to be or accused of being a billion dollars that had gone missing turned out to be $68,000 that, that had, had not been properly tracked. But because of the cuts, the, um, uh, it became the auditing process was not as rigorous as it had been. Part of the response to that was the, um, a push for a much more careful tracking uh, of, of money that, uh, that, is, that is spent. In uh, 2003, <clears throat> Sheila Fraser, then Auditor General, did a report on the Privacy Commissioner, um, George Radwanski, and was extremely critical of how he had been spending public money and how he had been misusing the, the rules for hiring for human resources. I think the phrase reign of terror was used in, in, uh, in the report. Um, accused him of having uh, neglected his, his duty in terms of responsible handling of, uh, of public money. Um, he resigned before he, he could, be, uh, could be fired by both, uh, both houses. It requires a vote of both houses of parliament to, uh, to fire an agent of parliament. And uh, in February 2004, um, Sheila Fraser wrote a devastating report on the sponsorship scandal in which she memorably said that uh, they broke every rule in the book. All of those incidents, from 2004 through, from, from uh, 2000 through to 2004, created a sense of the need to tighten the rules, have a big, thicker rule book, a more bureaucratic process of ensuring that the rules are respected, which emerged, uh, first of all, with, with reforms that were introduced in, during the Martin government and then the Accountability Act that was introduced by, by this government. We all live, and by we I mean agents of parliament, but also senior officials throughout government, in a post-HRDC, post gomery post-Radwanski, and now post Pamela Wall and Mike Duffy environment. Now there are, there are good things about this. It means that we all have to be much more careful. It means that we are all much more transparent. All of my expenses are posted on our website. Um, but there are disadvantages as well. It means that things happen more slowly. There is much more paperwork. There is um, a, the, the wheels of government move more slowly when there are, when people have to sign forms to, uh, at many more people have to sign many more forms to uh, approve any kind of discretionary spending whatsoever. So it's a, And that is becomes part of what we as agents of parliament inevitably have to do, which is to monitor how federal institutions are respecting the rules, whether they are spending rules, whether they are privacy rules, whether they are uh, access to information rules, whether they are the rules concerning official languages. Uh, political scientist David Smith has said that we are increasingly living in what he calls the audit society. And there are some observers of the political process um, uh, who are, are critical of the, the role of agents of parliament, who feel that, that, the, the, that agents of parliament have undermined the role of parliamentarians. I don't think that's true. I think that um, uh, uh, while I don't think there should be any more agents of parliament created, I think that what each one of us does provides tools for parliamentarians to do their job, their job better. Um, 
few brief words about the, the evolution of the, the, the position of ombudsman. Um, the job of ombudsman was first created by the, uh, uh, the king of Sweden in the late 18th century. And it was basically somebody who would go off and look at how his administration was performing its duties while he was off leading armies fighting wars in Europe. And so it was a kind of a king's spy who would see if uh, people were doing what they were supposed to be doing. In 1809, the king lost a critical battle. He was deposed, um, the, uh, uh, and um, the position of ombudsman became a parliamentary position. And so this is the 204th anniversary, if you like, of the creation of the ombudsman's role. Um, and uh, through um, around the world, those positions have become important ways in which parliamentarians have an independent tool to report to them on how the government that they are supposed to be holding to account is actually living up to, uh, to its responsibility. Let me tell you a little bit about how I had to adapt to moving from a career in which I really didn't have to manage anything more than a keyboard to being the head of an organization of 170 people. Um, it was, I was, I was actually quite um, uneasy about this through the, I felt that the, the interview would, that somebody would ask me, how do you, how can you possibly imagine running a government organization after having been a journalist for all those years. Um, and I had worked up an answer, which was that when I was bureau chief of the Globe and Mail, I had nine people reporting to me. Um, and that was a larger number than the number of people on the executive committee at the uh, Office of the Commissioner of Official Languages. I never got asked. Um, but it was a, an entirely artificial answer, since bureau chiefs um, don't have the power to fire, the power to, power to hire, or have any direct responsibility for managing a budget. So, um, uh, but it was, um, but in fact it was not a, uh, it had turned out that the, my management style, which, which was a fairly collaborative one, um, was one that I was able to, to transfer to, uh, um, the management of the, of, uh, but I learned a number of, a number of things about what it means to be the, uh, the head of a, a large organization. I think about policy. I worry about human resources. Uh, in many cases, the head of any large organization spends uh, a significant amount of his or her time worrying about the weak links in the organization. Spend, there's much more time spent in trying to solve the, the human resources, labor relations problems in an organization than there is in how can we uh, get our really good performers to be uh, even better. How do I deal with parliament? Well, I report to two parliamentary committees, one in the Senate, one in the House of Commons. And I concluded pretty early on that I had a rather fine line to walk. <clears throat> that if I did nothing but beat the government over the head, that I would lose any capacity that I might have had to actually have some kind of influence. That the, um, but if on the other hand, I was seen as being a pushover um, tolerant of government's failure to live up to their obligations under the Act, uh, too easygoing, seen as too close to the government of the day, I would lose the confidence of parliamentarians and I would lose the confidence of minority language communities. So it's, it's a careful line to walk, similar in a way to the line that any journalist has to walk, which is if they are seen as entirely predictable, that you know exactly what a columnist or a reporter is going to write before they've written it, then you don't bother reading them. You just know what they're going to, uh, what they're going to say. How would I measure success? 
And this became uh, a, a tricky, for as a reporter, it's relatively easy with the, you can simply check how many stories you've written, how many stories have gotten the front page, how many stories you've broken. Um, when you're an agent of parliament, you're in the influence business. Uh, I don't manage programs. I don't, uh, um, uh, I don't have a, other than my reports, my studies, my uh, and reports on investigations, it's difficult to say, it's difficult to measure actual impact. But there are a couple of things that I think I can point to as having been successes. Between the time my name was announced in September 2006 and my starting on the job in October, the government canceled the court challenges program. And by the time I'd arrived at the office, there were uh, 140 complaints about the cancellation of the court challenges program. The court challenges program was a program that funded people who were you going to court to um, challenge decisions that they felt took away their rights as defined by the charter. And um, so we did a very detailed report on whether or not the government had respected its obligations under the act, which requires the federal government institutions to take positive measures for the growth and development of minority language communities. Had they, had they consulted, had they taken any mitigating actions to reduce the impact of this decision? And we found that to a substantial degree, they had not. Now, before we'd finished that process, the Fédération des Communautés Francophones et Acadiennes took the government to court. We intervened on behalf of the, uh, uh, of the uh, FCFA. And our report was the only piece of textual evidence heard by the court. On the Friday before the judge was about to issue his decision, there was a meeting in the prime minister's office in which an out-of-court settlement was uh, uh, reached. And a, it was agreed that the government would set up an organization to fund language rights cases under the charter. The judge was quite disappointed because his decision was all written. And so very unusually, he had us all in a conference call on Monday to answer the question, are you really sure that this out-of-court settlement uh, is satisfactory? Uh, we all agreed that it was. And there is now a language rights program that's run out of the University of Ottawa, the Programme d'appui au droit linguistique. And uh, that, I think, was a very tangible result of, of work that we had done, of intervention before the courts. Another success, I would say, was the, the work that we did before the Vancouver Olympics. The Vancouver Olympics uh, was, on the ground, a great success in terms of delivering services in both languages. I was able to... Uh, register in French. I was welcomed in both languages. There were announcements in both languages. The signage was in both languages. The, um, was that one of my, no. Sorry? <laughs> okay, so just sort of step back like that. Okay. Why don't I just stand with this one in my, one in my. The, uh, even the private sponsors got into the spirit and were announcing in French and announcing a big, big posters in French, big posters uh, in English. There was one failure, and that was the opening ceremonies. And that got a great deal of attention, and it made me realize that failures are obvious, success is invisible. But one of the things that we also developed from that, having worked very closely with the inst federal institutions, was the degree to which planning is necessary for any national sporting event to ensure that it can actually operate in both languages. So we developed a, a manual for the organizers 
uh, laying out the kind of planning that needs to be done. And I was at the Canada Games in Sherbrooke uh, in uh, beginning of August, and it was a huge success in terms of both official languages. And there were people there from the Canada Games, Winter Games that are going to take place in British Columbia next year, and from the Pan Am Games in Toronto, and they were furiously taking notes on how well the Canada Games had done it. The Paradoxically, this may sound as if it were a failure, it turned out to be a success. The government appointed a unilingual auditor general. That stirred up controversy across the country. Uh, editorials criticizing this in the Calgary Herald and the Edmonton Journal, the Ottawa Citizen, not generally strong advocates of um, uh, a vigorous language policy. And the result of all that is that the, um, there was a private member's bill that was endorsed unanimously by all parties that has been passed into law ensuring that all agents of parliament henceforth will be required to be bilingual so that they can understand, speak to all Canadians, they can answer questions in French, they can have, have conversations with uh, members of parliament in the official language of their choice. One significant failure, and that was there was a private member's bill on requiring uh, judges of the Supreme Court to be able to understand testimony, pleadings by lawyers before the Supreme Court in English or in French. Um, interestingly enough, and it reflects the changes in coverage of the House of Commons, this went entirely through every step of the House without any coverage whatsoever. And it got voted on. The Conservatives had been clearly counting on this, this was when they were in a minority, on the Liberals voting it down, so their comments in the debate in the House were very, very uh, careful, saying, you know, we're not quite, we're not there yet, there are problems with the pool of possible candidates, we, you know, it's a laudable idea, it's an important asset. But when it passed and went to the Senate, all of a sudden the rhetoric got cranked up. This is unconstitutional, this is discriminatory, it discriminates against the unilingual. Um, and um, I, and when some of what I thought were some of the stupider interpretations of what this meant were um, in, in uh, uh, op-ed pieces, I responded and found out quite quickly how strongly the government disagreed with me. Um, I was told quite directly by uh, two ministers and the prime minister how strongly they disagreed with me. And um, the uh, legislation was talked out um, on the, uh, uh, in the Senate, died in the order paper, and, um, uh, and a uh, unilingual judge was named to the Supreme Court. Now, I don't think that was because, he was not named because he was unilingual, he was named because the government uh, appreciated the kind of decisions that uh, he had made in the past. Um, but um, it was nevertheless, I thought, a, uh, a setback. And in my view, a failure to understand how critical it is that the Supreme Court be able to understand pleadings and the documentation. One third of the cases that come from, from provinces come from Quebec. All of the previous pleadings, all of the factums have been written and pleaded in French. And so a judge who does not read or understand French is depending on the page and a half bench memo that's written by a freshly graduated uh, law clerk. And for a uh, lawyer who has pleaded a course, uh, pl pleaded a case at every stage through the process in Quebec and comes to the Supreme Court is suddenly faced with a dilemma. Do they make the arguments in French knowing that one or two judges are not going to understand them and count on the simultaneous interpretation? Do they do part of it in French or part of it in English? Do they, is the burden of bilingualism going to be on them to make themselves understood by the courts. 
and uh, not to mention what it means that for those French-speaking judges have to do all of their work in their second language. Interestingly, all the arguments that were made against the requirement were exactly the same arguments that were heard in 1969 against the Official Languages Act. It's discriminatory, there aren't going to be any lawyers that come, uh, and nobody from the West is going to be able to get a job with the federal government. It'll, um, the pool is much too small. Um, well, in the last few years, we've had a Chief Justice of the Supreme Court from Alberta, a Chief of the Defense Staff from, uh, from Manitoba, um, a uh, uh, Clerk of the Privy Council from Saskatchewan. Um, the idea that uh, this has proven uh, the end of any uh, possibility of people from Western Canada having senior, senior positions in government has proven to be totally untrue. Anyhow, proof that you win some, you lose some. Um, with that, um, let me answer any questions you might have. I'd put it the other way around. I think that journalists who are bilingual have an advantage, but I think that there are all kinds of areas uh, of journalism where knowledge of both languages is, uh, uh, is not essential. Um, but I would not expect, if you were a unilingual journalist, to be part of the group that was uh, uh, sent to Quebec City to follow the debate on the Charter of Values or sent to Lac Mégantic to uh, uh, interview um, residents after the, uh, after the disaster. Um, uh, I think that where it is extremely important for a, a reporter to be bilingual, bilingual is in terms of either understanding the country as a whole, no, understanding those debates that are happening in different form in Quebec than they are in the rest of the country. And we're seeing that playing out now with the debate over the Charter of Values, where it is, um, uh, I think, difficult to follow the uh, complexity of that debate if you uh, aren't able to read what's being written or hear what's being said in French, um, or to cover the Prime Minister. If the, I think that anybody who is a political reporter ought to be able to cover the Prime Minister um, wherever he goes and um, understand whatever he says. Um, not every, not every reporter has uh, uh, an am ambition to uh, to cover the prime minister. Not every reporter wants to be a, a, a political journalist. Um, but uh, the nature of the country is, and the nature of the language policy has never been to require every Canadian to be bilingual. The uh, the policy always was to ensure that the four million unilingual francophones in this country get the same level of service from the federal government as the 23 million unilingual anglophones. Um, so, uh, and there are all many parts of the country where um, one can live uh, a satisfying, successful, financially well-renumerated life um, without speaking the other official language, whether you're living in French in Quebec or in English outside Quebec. But if you want to understand how those two parts of the country interact, um, how the, uh, uh, the debates that have been generated in Quebec are reverberating across the country, it's important to be able to understand those debates in the language in which they were carried out. Um, <clears throat> first of all, there has been <clears throat> the language learning statistics are complex. Um, and um, for really the last 30 years, we've had a pretty constant level of 300,000 students um, uh, who are studying in French immersion. Um, the, the drop to which Ariana referred is a drop in the enrollment in core French. 
And I think there are a number of reasons for this. One of them is, I think, unfortunately, a bit of a, a <clears throat> collateral damage, if you like, from the success of immersion. Um, I think there are, immersion has tend to draw the students who are most interested in learning French. It has tended to draw the best teachers. And it has had the unfortunate side effect of devaluing um, French as a, uh, uh, as a core subject in high school. The other factor which one has to keep in mind is that there is no province west of Ontario in which French is obligatory at any grade. In every province, Ontar in Ontario and every province east, there are at least some levels in which the study of French is obligatory. It can be until grade nine, it can be between grade six and grade nine, it can be in grade nine, anyhow. There is, in every other, every province in eastern Canada, um, it is an obligatory subject. And the fact that it is a <clears throat> not an obligatory subject means that it often becomes a choice between taking French or taking music, taking French or taking art, and um, often the, the French teacher is in the difficult position of not even having a classroom, of moving their, uh, their stuff from one room to another in a trolley. So it is, um, what I think, one of the ways that I think is important is to develop a kind of cascade of messages in the educational system. I think it is important that government, the federal government say to universities that Canada's largest employer needs bilingual, bilingual graduates and that universities turn around to students and to high schools and say, we actually value second language acquisition and second language learning. <clears throat> we are going to provide opportunities for those students who didn't have a chance to learn, to, to acquire it at university, and we are going to give special uh, advantages to those applying who have taken a more difficult program when they were in high school. As things stand now, I've talked to high school students who have said that they've been told by their guidance counselor, don't take the course, don't take the, uh, uh, don't stay in immersion, you know, switch to English, you'll get, you know, they get, because universities don't care. I've spoken to other students who have said, don't take the immersion exam, take the core French exam, you'll ace it, you'll get a better mark. And that's all universities care about. That's all they're looking for, is just the number on the sheet. These are incentives to mediocrity. What we need are incentives to excellence. And so I think there are ways in which the, uh, and the, the problem, and one of the reasons that I am restricted in what I can do about this issue, is that it is a matter of provincial jurisdiction. Um, the Fathers of Confederation in 1867 in their wisdom decided that Ottawa would get all the things that they considered to be really important, which is to say foreign affairs, defense, major instruments of the economy, and they would leave all of the trivial, unimportant things to the provinces like health and education. Well, almost 150 years later, Canadians have a slightly different set of priorities in terms of what they consider to be important than the Fathers of Confederation did. And I think it's that difference of opinion that's been at the source of federal-provincial conflict ever since the Second World War. But that's a whole other subject. The, the short answer for the first part is how does the Official Language Act affect journalists is um, not much, except because of the successes of the act. Uh, 
now for uh, the whenever a government document is tabled or made public, it is made public simultaneously in both languages. You, we are now 20 years beyond the period in which the do federal documents would be published in English with French to follow. So it is uh, for any news conference that's uh, held in um, the press building, there is uh, simultaneous interpretation. So the Official Languages Act has ensured that journalists can get their information, their formal information, in either official language. Where journalists interact most with me, I get relatively little contact from English-speaking journalists because, by and large, majorities aren't particularly interested in the challenges of the minorities. I get a fair amount of attention from French language journalists who follow the cases that um, have been, uh, uh, are, that we are investigating, that write about the reports that we do on complaints, that write about our, uh, uh, our audits of federal departments, who write about the, uh, the reports that we do. Um, so for, and for uh, French speaking journalists, will find out very quickly whether federal departments are able to serve the public in uh, English or in French because if they phone up a uh, communications branch of a department and they f can't get somebody to explain a policy to them in French, they know that that, that department is not living up to its responsibilities under the Act. I get some complaints formal complaints that have been um, uh, presented by, by journalists. Um, so, but it's um, um, not surprising that um, uh, there was a period at the, when the first reports of the earlier commissions or commissioner's official language um, would be tabled, that they would get an awful lot of attention in the English press because language policy was seen as threatening to the uh, uh, English majority. It was seen as a barrier for people getting jobs. It was seen as, uh, uh, as, as unfair. And so, um, but that, that now to a much greater extent, um, uh, we, don't see, we don't see much. I'm uh, of, of the same level of interest from, um, uh, English-speaking journalists as from French-speaking journalists. One of the um, uh, terrific um, elements of this job is that it takes a vote of two houses of parliament to fire me. So um, I have a, um, a degree of job security that means that um, uh, my that the various considerations that I take into account um, uh, don't involve any fear that I'm going to lose my job as a result. Um, um, where I, where I um, do measure, measure my words carefully is um, I, I try and ask myself the question, how am I most likely to get results? How am I most likely to get a, um, an institution to change its behavior? Um, I've actually had a, um, a pretty cordial relationship with, uh, with the Prime Minister and, and with uh, his ministers. Um, as I said, over the issue of the Supreme Court, I was left in no doubt whatsoever that um, the, uh, uh, the Prime Minister and uh, two of his ministers um, uh, did not agree that bilingualism should be a criteria for, uh, an essential criteria for Supreme Court justices. Um, but again, part of... Um, 
Part of my approach, and you can contrast this with the approach that's taken by the Ontario Ombudsman, André Marin. Um, I don't think it is useful to publicly embarrass or humiliate um, uh, federal institutions. Um, I think it is more likely to generate um, resistance. It's more likely to uh, generate resentment and less likely to um, uh, get people to take the issue seriously. Um, I mean, one, another, the, another way of, of uh, phrasing um, my uh, role of, of uh, being part cheerleader, part nag, is I think that it's sometimes more effective to inspire public servants to live up to their responsibilities than it is to simply require them to live up to their responsibilities. My experience basically is that federal public servants want to do the right thing. They want to get it right. They are not intrinsically, there's not a deeply rooted antagonism or opposition to the idea that they have a responsibility to serve Canadians in both official languages. Um, and, uh, the, and I've observed, if you like, a, <clears throat> a change in, in the views of the Prime Minister. I, I interviewed Stephen Harper um, when he was leader of the opposition for my book on language policy. And it was pretty clear that he believed that um, uh, people outside Quebec spoke English, people inside Quebec spoke French, but that to achieve, uh, succeed at anything, they had to uh, speak English. And then he got elected in 2006, and um, nine of the 10 or eight of the nine MPs that, he was, that were elected from Quebec could barely put together a sentence in English. And he had a number of MPs from outside Quebec who would not get reelected if they were on the wrong side of the uh, official languages issue. And um, so any thought that any people in his caucus might have had that the new government was going to uh, revoke and repeal the Official Languages Act disappeared pretty quickly. Um, and, uh, and he has been personally quite rigorous in always using both languages, always starting off his public declarations in French, going through the declaration in French, and then going through the, the declaration in English. Um, there are, and I've been, ex my, my first mandate expires in about three weeks, and I was, um, the Prime Minister asked me to stay on for, for uh, another three years. And I'm convinced that the reason is because of the election of a Parti Québécois government in Quebec, that um, you've seen him say um, that um, the, uh, he does not want to pick a fight with, uh, with the Quebec government. He is trying to play as... as um, calming and distant and low profile a role in the controversies involving the, uh, uh, the Parti Québécois. And he, for whatever reasons, saw, um, I think I was the devil, that he, devil he knew. So I think that I was seen as a source of continuity at a time when um, he wanted the the language issue to be relatively low profile. And at this point, as I've concluded in other areas, it's failures that are obvious and successes are invisible. And he would like to have as many invisible successes on the language front as possible. I've actually taken some pains not to, um, to wade into the uh, um, the activities of the uh, Office Québécois de la langue française. Um, I'm in the language monitoring business myself. Um, I have to respond to complaints, some of which people may feel are, uh, are trivial. Um, there is one of the interesting things about the, uh, um, the, the complaint 
uh, investigation around the use of pasta on, a, on the menu, and for that matter, yogurt spoons, um, is that it ultimately resulted in the dismissal or forced resignation of the president of the Office Québécois de la langue française. So um, it is a uh, it is a challenge for anybody who is in an ombudsman's position uh, to decide what kind of tone they are going to adopt, what kind of, uh, how rigorous are they going to apply the letter of the, uh, the, letter of the law, um, and uh, to what extent do they use, do they have the discretion under their particular act to um, uh, focus on some complaints and not on others, and to what extent do they have no discretion. Some ombudsmen do not have discretion as to what, what uh, complaints they investigate. Others are able to say, I'm going to focus on that one because I can really embarrass the government on that. Um, the, um, uh, there, are, uh, there are times where um, I've used the discretion that I have to say, actually, we're not going to investigate this because I don't think it meets our criteria. Um, there are, but that can be tricky because you've got a complainant who is saying, this is what the law says. And so um, uh, while I think that the, uh, and that's, it, be, it, it, it can become a self-defeating process when the, when the, the I mean, I, uh, you know, I had, a, I had a very cordial meeting with Louis Marchand, who was the, uh, the former head of the uh, Fils Québécois de la langue française. Um, she's lost her job over, uh, over the way in which those, those incidents were handled. So I don't, I don't need to comment. It's, uh, it becomes a self-controlling mechanism. That, uh, and this, I think, becomes part of, part of my own view that I have to walk a line, that if I am seen as, as um, uh, beating the government over the head over, over, over trivia, um, that becomes self-defeating for me. I lose credibility. The only way that um, an agent of parliament is able to be effective is if they maintain credibility in the way they carry out their, carry out their work. And um, once you've lost credibility, then uh, you, lose, you lose your effectiveness. Thank you.